Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful uh, introduction. Let me just get you on gallery view so I can see some of you. Um, yeah, so it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be able to join uh, you tonight. So thank you for the invitation and for your attention um, and for your practice. Uh, oh, my, my last name is Wistazen. Wistazen. Um, it's a, I'm from South Africa originally, but it's a Dutch name. So it's a little, it's, it's a little tricky. Um, yeah, so feeding your demons. Uh, so I believe all of you or most of you are familiar with the process of feeding your demons. Um, you don't have to be if you're not. Uh, I'll lead us through it. Um, and so it's not required that you know the, the process, but maybe by way of brief introduction, uh, you know, as Mace uh, has said, it's, it's a process to deal with our obscurations, obstacles, basically to engage with our demons. And um, this, you know, it's not only obviously our personal demons, but also societal, can also be societal, transpersonal demons, the things that are going on in the environment around us. And so in times like now, uh, as May said also referenced, uh, where we have, you know, Supreme Court uh, rulings and we have war and we have pandemic and, you know, just, and, uh, environmental degradation and so forth you know sometimes we feel like enough already you know you just want to run for the hills there's this feeling of overwhelm perhaps that could set in like how and you know yet another thing and yet another thing just layered on top and how do we actually be with it all and uh you know so so feeding your demons going back to feeding your demons it's it's really the whole, all the work of feeding your demons is based on turning towards rather than avoiding, right? So, you know, I call it the path of no avoidance um, or the path of non-avoidance. It, 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 and yes, is there courage involved? Yes, there's courage involved in terms of conditioning ourselves to turn towards that which we would much rather reactively turn away from. And so this is, this is that, that practice that we are doing to, to really pay attention to what is challenging in our own lives, but also what is going on in the culture around us. And how do we actually do this? And so we'll do it tonight with Feeding Your Demons and you can choose, and maybe you wanna start thinking about what you would like to work with tonight. Um, don't have to distract yourself with that right now, but you know, you'll choose something and then we'll go through the process and, and come into close, more close uh, relationship with it. But uh, regarding this societal uh, issue of avoidance and non-avoidance, uh, you know, this work is based on uh, the practice of ch, C-H-O-D uh, with an umlaut on the O. It's, it's, it means cutting through ego clinging and it was developed by developed and you may know this but it was developed by uh, 11th century yogini called machik lapdran and machik lapdran uh, is was a very interesting and phenomenal woman of her time but she wrote this in, these incredible pith instructions so my wife and I have actually been um, really diving into that and we're in the process of writing a book using some of those pith instructions uh, and then applying it to everyday life, seeing if we can apply it to everyday life. And a lot of it is really radical teachings of nature of mind, right? And no self and so forth. But that is always beautiful and mind blowing, but how does it apply to everyday life? And that's that's the question. And uh, year again, you know, with all of these things going on in the world around us, how do we apply it to everyday life? And so I'd like to share a couple of quotes from her that I think may be relevant here. And so the first one is, and I quote, the defining characteristic of mind is to be primordially empty like space. 
the defining characteristic of mind is to be primordially empty like space. The realization of the nature of mind includes all phenomena without exception. The realization of the nature of mind includes all phenomena without exception. So this first part, right? So it, it, it's referring to the Buddhist view of no self, you know, the defining characteristic of mind is to be primordially empty like space, luminous emptiness. Uh, and in, in our meditation practice and so forth, this is usually geared towards relaxing and resting in the basic nature of our minds. And this also shows up in this practice of feeding your demons towards the end where in the dissolution phase where we dissolve and just rest in the nature, we, we dissolve and we just rest there. And so this is referencing that, but then she comes with the second part, the realization of the nature of mind. So the defining characteristic is primordially empty, but the realization of the nature of mind includes all phenomena without exception. So this is, this is that basically, you know, like in the Prajnaparamita Sutra where it says form is emptiness, but emptiness is also form. It's that middle way, right? It includes all phenomena. So it's really totality that we're talking about. The nature of mind is not somewhere out there where we find some place of rest where we can abide where there are no court rulings and where there is there like there are no problems and it's it's beautiful and cushy and empty it 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 actually includes all phenomena all manifestation all manner of manifestation what we may term as good and bad discouraging and encouraging hope and fear that's the defining characteristic of that emptiness that luminosity the luminous emptiness of mind, is that it actually is the ground of being out of which all phenomena manifests. And so um, there's a second quote that goes almost even a little further. And it says, carry the load of appearing conditions. If you don't carry the load of all phenomena, the remedy of peace and happiness can't liberate you. Carry the load of appearing conditions or phenomena. If you don't carry the load of all phenomena, the remedy of peace and happiness can't liberate you. So sometimes when we meditate or we practice, we, we find some respite, some place of rest, and we, we kind of just want to almost stay there. And then we feel like we come back to the world and all the issues and we get you know, that contraction that comes with fixation of focus and engagement. And so how do we bring those two together? Because this is really what she's talking about, carry the load of all phenomena. And so really what she's talking about is, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a great teaching on, on the avoidance of, 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 of not falling into spiritual bypassing or escaping into the absolute. Because she's saying, we have to turn, we have to open to totality. We have to open to all phenomena. We cannot avoid and pick and choose, cherry pick the good and you know, chase the good and, and, and avoid the bad. That's our default ego tendency, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how we set up. And that's generally how it goes. But, but really what she's inviting us to do is to investigate this place of resting that is not to the exclusion of anything and yet is vast and luminous and open. And in order to do that, we, we have to turn towards, we have to open our hearts and of course our minds, but we have to open our hearts and live with an open heart, live in that vulnerability. You know, and so like Charlotte has been saying, lately you know in the face of all of these things we have to love more fiercely we have to love more fiercely not less and so how do we do this though because you know there's this image of carrying the load of appearing phenomena it's like my small self is already carrying so much 
my ego construct is already carrying. So now I have to load more on it. It's, you know, and it just feels completely overwhelming. But this is not what she's talking about. She's not talking about our habitual self carrying even more, being a complete to the point of complete exhaustion. She's talking about relaxing the boundaries of self, going, resting in the transpersonal space of the ground of being through our practice. And from that vast view, we are resourced to not turn away. We are not standing in our small self in the face of overwhelming odds and just trying to be courageous and stick it out. Although of course it feels like that sometimes. No, we are opening this construct of a self, of a small self, and we are resources, resourcing from the very vast space that everything is arising out of. And from that place, we act. From that place, we engage, we remain engaged. It's nothing to do with being passive. We may think that, that we either resting in the nature of mind or we engaging, but really resting in the nature of mind is the view, the point of departure for how we engage in the world. And then from that resource, from that place, we can also do right action, engage in a way with as much wisdom as possible. So this is sort of the invitation and, in, and it's kind of, it's embodied, I believe, in this practice of feeding your demons where it's very specifically working with a specific uh, obscuration, right? And then externalizing it and then having this conversation. But then we, re we, we, we really become curious about it. We're really open to it, to this demon of ours, this, this issue that's been plaguing us, whatever it may be for you. But then once we've conversed with it and we've given it basically what would give it release, what would bring it relief, then we relax and we reintegrate with it. And then we dissolve and rest in that vast space. So I wanna invite you to join me to do the Feeding Your Demons practice. I'll lead you through it. Um, and I think, I believe, uh, or I've been told, I should say, that most of you are familiar with it. So this is what I was thinking is, I'll lead you through this practice. And then uh, maybe if we have some time at the end, and I think we, may, we should have, we could maybe do some, uh, if you're interested, we can do Q&A or just hear some comments um, from, from you as well. So there's a little bit more of a two-way thing going on. So, okay, so in terms, so the setup for feeding your demons, um, and it's a little difficult sometimes on video, but I really want to encourage you to do the setup so that so that you can do the process. Uh, Lama Sultram really emphasizes, and we emphasize the importance of actually switching places. So what you want to do is set up two seats, and some of you I know have already set it up like that. You want to set up two seats. That is, and so if I model it, if the camera is there, I'll be, my one seat will be here and I'll be conversing with myself. So you're not relating to the camera as much as relating to an aspect of yourself. And then when I invite you to switch, you'll switch places and you'll sit on the, the cushion that you've set up and you'll be, so you'll be switching back and forth like that. In the past when this has happened, I've had to restart the computer. So, should I talk? Hey, Peter, I know you can't see me, but um, uh, we're having a problem with our camera. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I can fix it without restarting the computer, which I don't want to do. So, we're here. There's about ten of us, more than that, in the room, and we're all we're all practicing with you. So, sorry you can't nice. see. It. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. I saw your setup earlier, uh, so. Okay. Uh, I have a good idea of how you set up. Yeah, so when I ask to switch, it's helpful to actually switch and to <laughs> embody, fully embody the, this, this being that you're going to project outside of yourself. Um, and then you really take your time and settle into, into its body and feel what it feels like to, to occupy it. And then I'll, I'll, re I'll invite you to switch back and so forth. Okay, 
So. And Peter, this is May. Sorry, I'm gonna just, uh, folks. I'm gonna disable the chat during the practice, and I'll put the chat back on when we're done. And I'm also gonna disable your ability to mute, unmute yourself. Thanks, Miss. Okay, so I'm assuming I'm going to assume that you're all set up, and. Yeah, this is an invitation to allow me to just guide you through the process. And so uh, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes during the duration of the process and start thinking what you would like to work with tonight. What is it that is causing you distress or taking your energy or that is, that's been most vexing or distracting for you as of late? I'll give you a few moments to think about that. It's helpful if you come up with something specific You could also just start with a feeling in your body. You don't have to name it. Okay. So we begin with is relaxing, relaxation breaths. And really the idea here is to just really relax as much as possible in the beginning of the process. So begin by breathing into any physical tension you're holding in your body. And then hook that tension with the breath and release it with the out breath and relax. So you're using the breath to dissolve any tension or discomfort in your body. Let it ride out on the out breath and you relax. Now breathe into any emotional tension you are holding. Notice where you are holding emotional tension in your body and then hooking that tension with the breath, release it with the out breath. Now breathe into any mental tension or worries or distractions you may be holding. Notice where you're holding mental tension in your body and then hook that tension with the breath and release, release it with the out breath. So let's generate a heartfelt motivation to not just practice for our own benefit, but to practice for the benefit of all beings. So now thinking about the demon you have chosen to work with, 
perhaps remembering a particular time or incident when it came up strongly for you. Really feel into it as much as possible. And then once you feel it really strongly, scan your body and locate where you are holding this demon most strongly in your body. So if you had to locate this demon in your body, where would it be? And now with your attention on that place or those places in your body, you notice the characteristics of this feeling in your body. So where is this demon held in your body? And what is its shape? Does it have a shape? Does it have a color? What is its texture? What is its temperature? And now I want to invite you to intensify the sensation in this place in your body or these places in your body and allow it to move out of your body and become personified in front of you as a being with limbs, a face, eyes, and so on. So you're moving the shape, this feeling out of your body and it's taking shape in front of you on the cushion or the seat in front of you. And so now you're noticing the characteristics of this being in front of you that's taken shape in front of you. And if it's changing, flashing from one to another, decide on which one to focus and just stabilize the image. So now notice about this being in front of you, what size is it? What is its color? What is the surface of its body? What is its density? Does it have a gender? See if you can look in its eyes. What is the look in its eyes? What is its character or its emotional state? Now notice something about it that you didn't see before, that you haven't noticed up to this point. So 
So you're now going to ask this being some questions. Don't wait for the answers, just ask the questions clearly. The first question is, what do you want? The second question, what do you really need? And the third question, how will you feel when you get what you really need? So once you've asked those questions, I'd like to invite you to physically switch places with the being. Take your time to really feel what it feels like to be in the demon's body. What does it feel like to be in the demon's body? How does your normal self look from the demon's point of view? If you look across at yourself, what do you look like from this point of view? Bringing your attention back to yourself as the demon. You have been asked these questions and you're now going to answer those questions, speaking as the demon. First answer is, what I want is, what I want is, what do you want? Second answer, what I really need is, this is the need underneath the want, the deeper need. What I really need is, what I really need is, And finally, when I get what I really need, I will feel, when I get what I really need, I will feel. You may imagine that need being completely met, even if it may seem improbable. Just imagine that need being completely and unconditionally met. What does that feel like? When I get what I really need, I will feel.
and take a note of this response, this feeling of having the need be completely met. As we'll come back to it in a little bit. So when you're ready, I'd like to invite you to switch back to your original seat. Take a moment to settle back into your own body. Settling back in your own body, see the demon opposite you. So now you're going to dissolve your body into a nectar. And the quality of that nectar, the essence of that nectar is that feeling that the demon had said it would have if it got what it needed. That feeling is what you are feeding the demon. And you may imagine there's an infinite supply of this flowing through you to the demon and then see, see the demon actually take in this nectar, ingest this nectar. Notice the color of the nectar and notice how the demon takes it in. And you're going to feed the demon until it is completely satisfied. Take your time to feed the demon this nectar, see how it takes it in. and continue until the demon is completely satisfied. If you have any doubt, whether the demon is satisfied, just offer it more nectar. Just keep offering it more until you're really sure it is completely satisfied. feeding it to complete satisfaction.
so if the demon is not completely satisfied at this point, so you may imagine what it would look like if it was completely satisfied. Just for those of you who have the demon not satisfied, you may imagine what it would look like if it was completely satisfied. So once the demon is completely satisfied, if there is a being still present there, you may ask it if it is your ally. Are you the ally? If it is the ally, if there is a being present and it is the ally, then we will ask some questions but if there's no being present or the, the being is not the ally, then you may invite an ally to appear. Invite a third being to appear as the ally. So either the demon has transformed into an ally or you've invited an ally to appear. Either way, your attention is on this ally. Noticing the characteristics of this ally. What size is the ally? What is its color? What is the surface of the ally's body like? What is its density? Does the ally have a gender? And again, can you look in its eyes? What is the look in its eyes? What is its character like and its emotional state? Now notice something about the ally that you did not see before, that you did not notice up to this point. So we're now going to ask the ally some questions. And again, don't wait for the answers at this point, just ask the questions clearly. First question is, how will you help me? How will you help me? Then how will you protect me? And then what pledge do you make to me? What pledge do you make to me? And finally, how can I access you? How can I access you? As soon as you've asked the questions, I'd like to invite you to switch places and to become the ally.
So you take a moment to settle into the ally's body. And then notice how does it feel to be in the ally's body? And looking across at your normal self, how, how does your normal self look from the allies' point of view? Now bringing your attention back to yourself as the ally. I'm going to answer the questions that have been asked. The first answer is, I will help you by, so speaking as the ally, I will help you by, I will protect you by, I will protect you by, I pledge to you that I will I pledge to you that I will. And finally, you can access me by you can access me by Now, is there anything else you'd like to share as the ally that might be helpful in working with this issue? Is there anything else you might like to share that might be helpful? So when you're ready, I invite you to return to your original seat.
and take your time settle back into your own body see the ally opposite you now as you see the ally look into its eyes and feel its energy pouring into your body and as you feel this energy of the ally coming into your body it spreads all the way down to the soles of your feet to your fingertips and throughout your entire body Now imagine that the ally dissolves into light. And notice the color of this light. And then feel this light dissolving into you. Integrating this luminosity into every cell of your body. Take note of this feeling of the integrated energy of the ally in your body. Now you, with the integrated energy of the ally, dissolve. And then rest in the state that is present after the dissolution. Just rest. Now gradually come back to your body, recalling the feeling of the energy of the ally in your body. And then as you open your eyes, maintain that feeling of the energy of the ally.
Mace, do you generally take a short break? Do people want a short break or do we just continue? We generally just continue, but you are running the show. <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll just give people a chance to integrate a little more and come back. Do people have the ability to unmute themselves? Okay, great. So I'm wondering, I know it's always such a open and vulnerable space after going through the process. Um, and so thank you also for entering in that space. Um, and indulging me to to lead you through the process, uh, but I'm wondering if if anyone uh, would like to share something of their experience or have a comment or a question about uh, you know what we talked about, what I talked about beforehand, or uh, yeah, a question about feeding your demons or a comment of sharing of what came up for you. That may be interesting for others also. Yes, there's someone waving. But I think you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. My name's Alex. Um, I wanted to share that I noticed a lot of flow through most of the steps and a lot of connection and flow between the visualizations. For me, except with the offering of the nectar, I noticed the most resistance coming up there in the form of um, just more thoughts, more distracted thoughts, and also a sense of feeling very drained. I felt um, some of the thoughts said things like too small or um, yeah, it was just notably different for me. And I'm wondering if that comes up often or how to work with that or. Yeah, when you when you when you thought too small, for example, uh, and now it's just an example of one of the thoughts, but too small in relation to can you contextualize it a little more in relation to yourself uh, or what you were feeding? 
my visualizations were very connected to what I was feeling in my body through most of the um, steps. But with that, it became more mental. I wasn't really feeling what the demon wanted. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it really became distinct because it was kind of a mirror experience when I was embodying the ally and the ally that giving me that thing, it was much more flowing. It was flowing a great deal more and I was feeling it yeah. more than the nectar. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is, it is uh, not unusual to, to, to have um, perhaps a more challenging experience with the feeding because that's, that's sort of where we really, that's kind of the, a little bit of where the rubber meets the road of this process. It's, it's one thing to imagine the demon, you know, and we already have to turn to it there and then go through the whole flow of it. But at that point, we are giving it sort of we we you know really come into relationship with it and have to give it what it wants or in that case you know uh what it really uh, how it would feel if it got what it needed and so it it often is is a is a kind of a more uh sticky part of the process uh for people and you know um you can get a little stuck there um and so forth. So I think that's that's quite normal. Uh, in one way, what it also makes makes me think, and I don't want to hijack your question and to relate it to what I was talking about, but perhaps perhaps there is a you know a relationship here, um, and and maybe it's because you said the too small, is that it has to do again with who is feeding and what is what are we feeding from, you know, and so. There's this there's this uh, invitation in the in the script to to imagine you have a limitless supply, and and also to sometimes I, and I think I said it in this time is to imagine a kind of a infinite supply of this nectar flowing through you, because sometimes because we're in a relationship with our demon. Uh, where there could be you know there's there's there could be resentment there could be uh, a kind of a poverty, a scarcity of wanting to being able to satisfy this demon. Because if we were able to satisfy this demon so easily, we, you know, conceivably might have done that long ago already. And so um, there, this is really where that relationship comes out. And so we may feel like we don't have enough of what it takes to satisfy this demon. But that's where you can imagine uh, <clears throat> more like, uh, a kind of a universal source of this nectar coming through you. So it's not like you have to generate the nectar on your, you know, in by yourself. You're, you're sort of what I was referring to as the small self. You don't have to generate this nectar if you don't feel like you have the wherewithal to do that. You can imagine that you're dissolving, or if that's not com uh, comfortable, you can just imagine it flowing through you from an endless supply i mean does that does that make sense in the context of your experience it does that really does speak to um, what i was experiencing and it makes me wonder it might sound unrelated but i feel curious are there any variations of this practice where the ally is visualized first and that process is moved through before visualizing the demon or is it always in that order and is there like the reason what's the reasoning you know, it is always in that order um, for various reasons. For the most basic reason is is sort of just for consistency uh, to to have the process be uh, standardized and so that you know so it can be um, um, propagated and people always use the same the same process. But there's also a, a, a underlying logic to it, and that is that uh, this idea that the 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 demon uh once once it's um it's given what it wants or once it's it's its needs are met it transforms into an ally and and this has its roots in the original practice and machik's life and so forth is is that uh you know i guess from a from a psychological 
point of view, you could say th this is all us, right? These are aspects of us, of our, our personality. And, um, and those aspects, you know, we have, we have patterning that are locked in specific postures. So these demons are, are aspects of our personality that's locked in a particular posture and that, that maybe has polarity and tension with other aspects of ourselves. And so really when we resist and try and overcome or suppress or repress that, that, that uh, aspect of our personality or avoid it, we're, we're actually giving it energy in a weird way and maintaining it in that posture. So we, through this polarity and it kind of keeps haunting us but through this practice, at least conceptually, when we turn our attention with compassion and open-heartedness, hopefully, to that aspect of ourselves, then, uh, and we give it love, basically, or give it what it needs, it, it, can, it can actually relax and transform and integrate more into our psyche. So it's kind of like bringing the light of our awareness to the dark corners of our psyche a little bit to, to put it in a Jungian, from a Jungian perspective. And by virtue of shining the light there, we see that that dark corner is not as scary as it, as it always seemed from, a, from through the lens of, of just avoidance and fear. And so it transforms actually, and then can integrate. And so oftentimes that, that, that energy that was previously the demon transforms into an ally. And so this is this idea, this is kind of the classic script of this, is you have the demon, you, you turn to it, you ask it what it wants and what it really, and how it would feel. So that's the resolution of that, that tightness of that energy, that constriction. And so then when you feed it, it, it actually, what it really, how it would feel, the resolution, then it, can, then it actually relaxes and then it transforms into an ally. So, but it doesn't obviously always go according to script. So, uh, you know, what I say is, uh, is to really step back from the whole process. And generally there are helpful, even if it didn't go according to script or you got stuck a little bit somewhere, they're generally still helpful aspects. You know, you're still seeing something um, about this issue that, uh, that, hope, that otherwise you may be, um, you know, did not notice. So hopefully, hopefully you had, you know, some experience like that, even though maybe that, that you know, it seemed, uh, you know, uh, sorry. And then one more thing, I, I know I'm kind of going on long, you know, on and on here a little bit, but this, this is, and maybe something else you referenced is we, we could also, this is something we do do. We don't switch the process where the ally comes first, but sometimes when someone has a hard time feeding and they feel like they, they can't possibly generate what it, what's needed to feed the demon. You can, you can imagine an ally, you can call on an ally to help you with the feeding process. So that could either be an, an older ally that came out in a previous process, or you can just like conjure, you just invite an ally to appear to help you with the feeding process and to assist you. So in that sense, the ally would come in earlier and actually help with feeding the demon. And that, that's definitely a possibility as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Harley. Yeah, Harley, Peter, Elena. this is... Um... It's Sally. on a similar vein. Um, I was curious about feeding the demon, or yeah, feeding the demon the feeling as opposed to feeding it what it really needs. Yeah. And so I was curious about that. Yeah, it's, it's so, uh, I touched on that just briefly. It's, it's, it's kind of a refinement process. Uh, if, you know, if, you know, let's just, use a, a kind of a, a, a surface um, type of example. Let's say you, excuse me, you're working with addiction and you, you, you know, maybe with uh, alcohol and you say, what do you want? And the demon might say, I want a glass of whiskey. You know, I want to drink, I want to become drunk right now. And you say, well, what do you really need? What do you really need? And so 
then it's a deepening, right? As you kind of also referenced. And so then, then it's really like, well, well, what I really need is kind of just to be listened to, to be seen, to be accepted and so forth. And now there you can feed acceptance and, and so forth. That, that, that would probably work quite well. Um, but then there's a further step here and, and that's supposed to even further refine that, bring us to, a, to actual resolution. And that is, well, imagine, and that's why I said, it's not always kind of clearly written out in the process, but that's why I was saying, really imagine, imagine receiving, feeling as the demon, that need being met, even if it may seem improbable, but just imagine, oh no, actually I, that need is completely met. And then see what it feels like. And generally that is some kind of feeling of relief uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be relief, but some kind of feeling of resolution, some kind of feeling of, like, oh, I've, I, I've received what I need is there's a, there's a kind of a relief or resolution in that. And so, and then that feeling of resolution or, re you know, that is then it's sort of the most resolved energy of, of this whole demon dynamic. And that's then what we feed. And that's why we feed it because it's sort of, it's the furthest, the most refined and the most resolved kind of energy. Thanks, yeah, that makes sense. Harley, I think you also had a question. Yes, uh, and thanks for this. And, uh, and I hope uh, you leave details of how we can reach out to you. Um, Something that uh, surprised me is, is the demons seem to personify uh, my ancestral conditioning and, uh, and was, was very huge. And at the same time, the ally ended up being an uncle who personified that in my life. And but and the the aura was his pale blue eyes. The color that emanated uh, was was my uncle being there and and somehow uh, manifesting in this pale blue color. And even till he died just eighteen months ago, and till the very end, we had a conversation where I apologized to him for what he had inflicted on me, but he was there for me. And it was so amazing to feel that. It was, it was truly <laughs> something, um, you know, that I would have hoped for in life, but uh, that he was my ally in this conversation. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's 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 beautiful and powerful we we some of you who know this work better you know we often say um when you work with uh let's say you work with a relationship then don't work with the other person work with your feelings around the relationship um, and then people take that as a very strict injunction that you you're not supposed to work with other people at all um, but but so in this case, this is a beautiful example of where someone comes in your family, an actual person, uh, not an actual person, but a, someone who, you know, a family member who, who was alive and, not, you know, it's not, not some imaginary being or something, but, and, and, but then you, you refer to the aura of that person. So they represent something in this process in, as an ally. They come in their ally aspect and uh, with those blessings and so forth. And, 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 and mostly, usually, and it sounds like here as well, without the complexity of that relation, they represent a specific, in this point, in this case, a particularly powerful allyship. Um, I love that. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. I did. I don't know if there was a question in there. I I didn't hear one, but I specific, um, unless I just missed it. But I I think that's beautiful. Thanks, Arlene. Yeah. The only question? question was how do we connect with you uh, after this this exercise yeah I, I put my email in the chat feel free to reach out um uh yeah i i'm uh i 
I am at Tara, you know, I work at Tara Mandala in different capacities. I'm, I'm on the board at Tara Mandala, but I'm also, uh, I'm also uh, working, uh, I'm the director of the online Feeding Your Demons program. So that's another sort of capacity that, that I'm in. And then uh, I teach a variety of, of online courses and other things through Tara Mandala. And then this work that I'm very excited about that I mentioned, we call it SkyMind. Um, and there's a retreat actually coming up in the fall, and you can see it on uh, on uh, the Tara Mandala website. There's a sky mind, and I'll say taramandala.org. I don't have that exact link, but I think it's, all, it's on there. It's just an online course. Uh, we have one meeting a week for eight weeks, um, a two-hour meeting. I think it's on a, on a weekend. And um, we talk more about Machik Lapturin and these verses, and then really about application to everyday life. You know, what does nature of mind mean in terms of everyday life? And is it applicable? And if so, how? And so um, that's another way, uh, you know, that's another way of connecting. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Um um that was that was very profound and i had a i mean i had no expectations a little bit of um study coming in but um visually it was um specifically when engaging with the demon there was a lot of um i guess morphing uh, but also when specifically asking those questions uh it it was it was pretty emotional for myself and i just was curious if i wanted to you know continue this practice um just really engaging with this shadow um what other obvious and obviously continuing this this healing this symbiotic relationship to hold it um what else would you recommend just some basic questions to build off of what we the script that we have yeah. Um, so there are a variety of ways, right? So the one obvious one uh, is that question, how can I access you, uh, that we ask the ally. Uh, so, you know, that's the opportunity for the ally to give you instructions and say, well, you know, um, go outside and look up to the heavens and, you know, or go, you know, when you're in nature or whatever it is, you know, sometimes uh, we, you know, you, if, if, if it was a particularly meaningful ally that you'd like to continue working with, uh, you could do something, uh, an effigy or some, some, something that symbolizes that ally, um, you know, like a, a, a refrigerator magnet or hanging something from your rear view mirror or putting something on the fridge that reminds you uh, or you could do art, you know, uh, if, if that's, if that appeals to you, um, we also, you, you, you know, there's this whole other aspect of this work when you, you draw the ally, um, and, and then you put that up somewhere where you can see it. And that reminds you then to keep sort of remembering it and integrating that, that, that energy. So those are different ways. Uh, but there is there is something called the extended ally process also, and uh, I think we generally, you know, there are levels of this work that we teach. There's this level one, uh, and it's an online, you know, now mostly offered online. Um, also, we used to uh, offer it, and I think Lopan Chandra is actually teaching it right now in Europe. But we haven't, with uh, COVID, we haven't been offering it in person in the United States. So mostly it's online. But uh, generally, we teach the extended ally, I think, process in the second level of this work. But what that is, is basically uh, you, you can, now that you have an ally, if you want to work more with that energy, you go back into the process with the ally and you see the ally in front of you. And uh, you, can, uh, you can either just do it as a follow on from the process and at the end you continue in this vein or if you have a specific ally that you now now identified you can just start with this extended ally and you you sit down you relax you do the nine relaxation breaths so you relax and then you you visualize the ally again or you invite invoke the ally 
And then you have a conversation with the ally. You ask your own questions, unscripted, of the ally. But you first you sit in your own body, you manifest the ally, you ask those questions, kind of like just what he did in the process. Then you switch places. Don't just ask two or three, you know. Then you switch and then you answer the questions. And you can repeat the switching, you know, two questions, two or three questions at a time. Maybe keep it to two, you know, so it doesn't become two. So you can actually continue the process and come up with your own questions, you know, like why, why what is this blue? And I'm, I'm just using, um, Harley, I'm just using your example, if you don't mind, but, you know, what is this blue aura? This pale blue aura, for example, uh, what is the meaning of that? You know, whatever questions that you have about the ally, you can then ask. And um, it, it's, it's, it's so profound in a way. It's, it's really a simple way of, of giving voice to uh, our wisdom self or a wisdom aspect of ourselves. And um, of course we have that wisdom in us, we have, but somehow we are in such a kind of uh, locked into a habitual relationship with, with these aspects, with our demons, with these aspects of ourselves um, that, um, you know, we need something like this or, or we don't need this, but this is helpful to put us to change the relationship because we actually really projecting it outside of ourselves as is as if it is something outside of ourselves then we can have this other conversation and then we get information that we that we we can't access otherwise so easily so that's sort of the uh, the, the great thing about this process it, it gets, it's always usually i think the the, the most the classic sort of reaction is, is surprise. There's always some kind of surprising thing that we find out or hear the ally. It's not predictable what the ally is going to say. I mean, to an extent, maybe some things, but there's usually something that we're like, huh, would never have, if we just said to ourselves, give, you know, what is my best advice for this issue? We would, we would come up with something different to what the ally gives us. There's another question um, in this space. I have a question. Uh, my name is Dean. Uh, it, it's sort of a question and sort of an observation. Uh, the question is, am I thinking about the certain steps of the process correctly, or maybe maybe I'm not quite on about it. So when I get to the question, um, what is it you want? I find that there's more sort of like confusion in my mind. It's because I'm trying to think like my, it's like, what is it you want? Like, you know, why are you doing this? Or, you know, what, why are you like this kind of thing? I, I don't quite I always have trouble with the, what is it you want, but then the later question is, what is it that would satisfy you? And I feel almost a sense of relief is, oh, I know what that is. You want to sort of like impose on me the way you do. And, and so I, I, I don't know if, if maybe I'm misunderstanding one or the other, but it seems like they should be almost the same to, to what is it you want versus what is it that I can give you that will make satisfy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, in a way, if you get to that answer by the third the third answer is like, what is it, you know, what do you really need? And then how would you feel if you got what you needed? And it sounds like you're getting to that answer and the clarity of it. And that's really the point. So in a way, it doesn't matter so much that you're not getting a clear answer to the want, because the, the, the idea, as I said earlier, when I was responding to Sally, is that it, it's, a, it's, it's a refinement and it's about coming up with a clear answer of something deeper than just, I want a glass of whiskey or, you know, 
uh, which sometimes can happen. It doesn't sound like that's what's happening with you, that you get some, some kind of um, surface you know, answer to what, what, I, what I want is. So in, in, a, in a way, it doesn't matter so much because what we're really interested in is the clarity of what you could really give it that would make it resolve. And it sounds like you're getting there um, anyway. So I don't think there's a misunderstanding there. I do want to say, you know, what, what, what is important in that that was, it was more like subtext in someone else's question. So I, I you know, I'm just wanting to mention it in case it's relevant. Um, and of course, it might not be relevant to you, but it might be relevant to some others is, is the, the, the reason we have these, these questions about, well, what, what is the size? What is the color? What is the texture? What is it wearing? Notice something you haven't noticed before. It's, it's, it's not some, you know, secret code to really unlock. I mean, it does, all of those things do give us some information about it. We want to glean as much information as possible. And so that it's helpful, but really what it is, is to, to really reify, to really establish this entity as a, as a different entity out to, to separate from us and to, to, to have it. And so the more we kind of emphasize, and of course it's not really separate from us, but we're playing this game, right? We're projecting it out, reifying it as a separate thing. And, the, and, and if, we, if, we are, if we're able to do that, then when we step into and we become the demon, then, um, you know, then it's not so much of us wondering like, what does it really want? But it's it itself saying, feeling into itself and saying, oh, this is what I want. And it oftentimes is again, something unexpected, something that we would not have guessed that it would want. Um, so that I guess is just an invitation as you continue with this work is to, to sort of emphasize this, this, you know, ex exacerbate or overemphasize the separateness so that you, you know, because sometimes if you just sit there, you know, if you don't switch places, you can answer from both points of view. That's why we kind of overemphasize this, this play of really stepping into that entity, into that energy, and then really coming from an, with an answer that really comes from it rather than from what you think it would say, you know? So I'm, I'm not saying that's, that's what you're doing or you're not doing this. I'm, I'm just, I just wanna kind of emphasize that aspect also. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe a last comment or question before we close. Okay, beautiful. So uh, I would just like to say from my side that uh, I, I really appreciate being here tonight uh, with all of you. Thank you so much for your attention and participation. And, um, you know, I do believe that this helps others, um, you know, and even if it's just, you know, not, I, I mean, I believe in some larger energetic way, it does make a difference. Uh, but, but more specifically, the people that you come in touch with in your life, you know, tonight, tomorrow, and so forth, um, you know, may, may the benefit, any benefit that you derive go out and benefit others in, in your life um, and out from there and really have benefit in the world. So um, let's take a moment and uh, do a dedication uh, based on that. And then we'll say goodbye. <sighs>
So this is always an opportunity to just drop into that vast space I was talking about. The space of dissolution at the end of the feeding your demons practice or the space of your meditation practice. And take a moment to relax. and open our hearts. Let go of boundaries for this moment. Let go of holding to anything. Rest completely and open up. And then from that place of self-arising compassion, We dedicate any merit to the benefit of all beings. Memo. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and a good week. Good night. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.